Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our series on Virginia during the Restoration. Today's episode starts in 1671, where Virginia still had not found its path forward economically. It had been a tough decade for the colony, damaged by poor trade policies of England, a war with the Dutch, and a hurricane, the colony is trying to find its way forward. In September of 1671, the House of Burgesses met and approved a request from the residents of Jamestown to repair their old wooden homes. This law was apparently requested by residents who were responding to the possibility of the colony passing a law requiring new homes to be built. So they were concerned they were going to be to told to tear it down and build something new. So imagine having to tear down and build a new home while you're going through essentially an economic depression. The colony had also set up a commissioner style oversight of the forts that it had just built and it started the lapse when a few of the commissioners died and so you had only a few people overseeing all of them. So the assembly called for the reestablishment of the commissioner system to oversee the five forts, basically telling these people if that's what they're going to do, they need to reassign new commissioners for the forts throughout the colony. In the September assembly meeting, we see the first cracks of instability in the colony. Let's have a look. Whereas there is at present an emergent occasion of representing to His Majesty's supplication and address the great obstructions of the property of this country in general, and particularly the damages like to be sustained by the inhabitants of the northern parts by the alteration of their tenures and alienation from their immediate dependence upon His Majesty by interposure of the new grants, frustrating those gracious favors formally conceded, how prejudicial they be to the property of his subjects. It is ordered by this grand assembly that the government do please with Mr. Secretary in the service of Henry Randolph, clerk of the assembly to cause a humble petition and address showing these and all other grievances of this county to be represented to his sacred majesty by major general smith who is hereby ordered to be empowered to negotiate the public affairs in england according to the instructions shall be given to him so there's grievances to be aired it's up in the northern part of virginia where we've had some problems before, if you recall, several episodes ago, earlier on in our study of Virginia history, the Northampton part of Virginia actually wanted to be self-governed. They actually asked for independence at some point, and this is a uh, similar area of the colony that's having issues now. A public address of the grievances is set, scheduled for January. And we get to January of 1672, and Governor Berkeley requests from England men who are experienced at producing silk, once again making that request. This is something we've seen all throughout episodes on Virginia. He even offers to pay for their cost of transport. So he is getting more generous in what he's offering anybody willing to help him. In February, Thomas Grantham writes to the king and Lord Commissioners of the Plantations. He reports that Virginia has run out of powder and ammunition, so no ammunition, and is in a vulnerable position. Grantham offers to transport ammunition at his expense to the colony. So here's a guy that's stepping up and saying, I will for free move ammunition from England to Virginia. In March, the king writes to Governor Berkeley, but it is not good news. England has decided to go back 
to the trade convoys. These were groups of merchant ships that would sail in mass with a military escort across the Atlantic Ocean to England. And before, they did it three times a year. So that was it. That was all the trade you got. So you had, a, you had ships coming in providing the goods you needed to your port three times a year. It's tough. And so this further limited Virginia's access to the market. England was doing this because the third Anglo-Dutch war had broken out. So we are back at war with the Dutch. We have yet to get Henry Randolph's address to England. He's the one that's supposed to communicate some issues uh, to England going on in Virginia. But in July, we do see a letter from Sir Henry Chickaly in Virginia. He writes to his brother in England who was in charge of military supplies. Let's have a look at his letter. The governor and Grand Assembly of Virginia have been pleased to make choice of me to present their humble desires to his most sacred majesty in this enclosed petition, wherein is truly manifested the present state and weak condition of this country against the invitation or attempt of any foreign enemy, which we may justly fear in this time of wars. And indeed, I may truly say there is no country under His Majesty's dominion in so poor a condition for defense as Virginia for want of both arms and ammunition of all sorts. So now Virginia's pleas have shifted from economical to military. They're in a war with the Dutch and they have no way of defending themselves. Chickaly adds that 20 regiments of foot and horse had been raised, but cannon were needed for the forts. These are the forts that a bunch of money was paid to build just a few years ago. Chickaly paints a negative picture if help does not arrive. Let's have a look. We must be forced to fly to the mountains for our security and leave this country and our estates a prey to the invaders. I think it cannot be denied but that Virginia yearly raise a greater revenue to the crown by our customs than any one plantation under His Majesty's dominions. Therefore, I hope we may most justly implore his princely patronage. So if an enemy invades Virginia, they're going to flee inland, which is probably not going to be seen as pleasant to the natives. And obviously the loss of Virginia, as Chickaly indicates, would be a huge economic blow to England. Chickley does refer to a letter by the governor and the assembly being enclosed, but unfortunately we don't have access to it. In September, the General Assembly meets again and passes a motion to have another address sent to the king describing the steps taken by the colony to fortify itself and to make a request for artillery. In the address to King Charles II, the assembly blames the low price of tobacco for its inability to afford artillery. The assembly once again requests artillery. The winter of 1672 was a rough one because in March, Berkeley writes to the Council of Trade and Plantations and says that half of the colony's cattle died over the winter and that they have about 20% of the goods that they need. He also once again requests ammunition. So the winter of 1672 making things worse for Virginia. In an almost sheer repeat of events seven years earlier, the Dutch would attack Virginia again in 1673 and take several of their tobacco ships. Thomas Ludwell once again wrote an account of this in August, stating that eight Dutch ships burnt 11 of their ships and took more from the colony. 
Ludwell summed up his request for the colony. Let's have a look. Enforce me in this sad conjecture to implore your lordship's assistance towards his majesty when our declaration shall be presented to the council table that the true state of our present condition being weighed and our inabilities to defend ourselves considered and the consequence of saving so considerable a plantation which employs so many ships, spends so much of the manufacture of England, and being so great a revenue to the crown being duly valued. His Majesty may be graciously pleased to afford us that protection which we cannot give ourselves. Again, asking England, look at what value we are to you and ask yourselves, is it worth defending? In October 1673, the Grand Assembly met. The Assembly acknowledged that Henry Randolph had died. That's why we never saw any uh, plea that we thought would be coming from him. But we're already hearing from plenty of people. The Grand Assembly wasn't hurting for trade of all things as uh, the importation of horses was banned. That was interesting. Uh, trying to control certain imports while you really do have an economic crisis. So apparently the 8,000 horses that were in Virginia were deemed sufficient. There was no mention of the Dutch attack or an attempt to react to it. In November, the Council of Virginia writes to the King and Privy Council. The letter starts as a defense of the actions of Governor Berkeley. Let's have a look. But this governor oppresseth them not, but on the contrary spends all his revenue amongst them in setting up manufacturers to their advantage who will follow his example. Nor ought we in gratitude to permit the advantages this whole country has received from the conquest of the Indians and the peace we have so long enjoyed. Another part of the letter reads, We do assure your majesty and your most honorable counsel that it was wonderfully beyond what could be expected from a man of his age, for he exposed his person to the greatest danger of the enemy by night and day on the water and on the land, visiting the remoter parts and with his presence encouraging everyone to do well in their places. So Berkeley is being a hands-on governor doing what is best for the people, but the fact that he's going out and visiting remote places I think is a hint that there's some problems going on out in the frontier. And at the time of this letter, Berkeley is 68 years old. He's no spring chicken. The council letter is signed by all of the counselors, and we recognize of that group Henry Chickley, Edward Diggs, Thomas Ludwell, and there's a new name on the council, a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Bacon, who is going to be a big part of the next several weeks of this podcast. Nathaniel Bacon was 26 years old. His father was close friends with Governor Berkeley, and Bacon had just arrived in the New World. His reason for coming to Virginia at this time was a little scandalous. He had been accused back in England of cheating someone out of their inheritance. Bacon's father, Thomas Bacon, gave his son 1,800 pounds and sent him to Virginia. Berkeley almost immediately put Bacon on the colony's council. So uh, Berkeley really trusted Nathaniel Bacon and brought him in. While a very little writing exists for the first half of 1674, what I can tell you is that Virginia settlers were pushing further into the frontier. While relations with the natives were rather stable, some were looking to expand further outwards. Additionally, in 1674, a man named Giles Bland came to Virginia. He was looking to manage a considerable estate inherited by the death of his father. Unfortunately, fighting within the family, 
led to a few lawsuits, and Bland found himself at odds with Council Secretary Thomas Ludwell. The Grand Assembly met in September of 1674 and appointed Colonel Francis Morrison, Secretary Thomas Ludwell, and Major General Robert Smith to negotiate the colony's affairs with England. The Assembly felt that with three persons, the work could be carried forward if one of them were to die. Thomas Ludwell and Colonel Daniel Park were actually appointed to travel to England with the authority to borrow up to 2,000 pounds to support the colony. The assembly would accept an interest rate no higher than 6%, fairly similar to today's loan terms. The early signs of insurrection appear in the assembly notes at this time, and again, we're in the fall of 1674. Let's have a look. Whereas Mr. Secretary has complained to this house that by the malice of some and ignorance of others who envy the peace and happiness of this colony, it has been whispered about this colony that the said Mr. Secretary is suspected to have had private correspondency with the Lords Arlington and Culpepper and has been a secret promoter of that patent by them lately obtained by his sacred majesty. I think we found the source of contention between Giles Bland and Thomas Ludwell. Bland thinks that there is a secret patent benefiting Thomas Ludwell and that impairs his ability uh, to manage his estates. Let's have a look at further writing. This assembly thereupon have thought fit to declare that they are abundantly satisfied of the true loyalty, great affection, and good service of said Mr. Secretary, highly manifested to this colony, and do therefore adjudge and declare the said reports and whispers to be most false and scandalous, and that the fomenters thereof, when known and discovered, be proceeded against as enemies to the peace and welfare." of this colony and so somebody is slandering apparently public officials and it's not going to be tolerated so the people sourcing the heresy are not totally known to the assembly yet but in the next paragraph the assembly requests giles bland to appear before them by the next assembly in november the general court admonished bland for nailing one of Ludwell's gloves up on the state house door with a scandalous libel attached to it. As 1674 turns into 1675, the squabbling in Virginia is about to turn into rebellion. And we'll talk more about it next time on Historical Context.